the, uh, the, the first of our, our afternoon speakers is a, is a great honour to welcome. Uh, that is Benoit Felton, who joins us from, from uh, Yankee Group. Look, there is a brief description about Benoit in, his, in, the, in the paper, but everything you really want to know about Benoit, you'll find out on his blog, which is Fibre Evolution, all as one word with only one E, dot com. Um, good place to have a read. You guys have already been written up on it once, and no doubt there'll be more about you in the next few days, I guess. Benoit, is that correct? Um, so, look, uh, without any further ado, I'm going to, Benoit is going to talk about the simplest topic of the whole day, of the whole two days, open access. It was the only thing that, it was the thing that had the most different versions and interpretations in the submissions that the Commerce Commission received. The good news is that I, Benoit is not going to define it, he's just going to tell us all why it makes economic sense. So could you please welcome Benoit. I guess I have three thank yous first. The first is to the Commission for having me here. It's a great honor. The second is to uh, David for mentioning my blog. He'll get a few dollars from uh, Google AdWords from me. And uh, the third is to you for staying. So uh, I'll try to make this as entertaining and provocative as I can. And I'm going to try to define open access in there as well as define why it makes sense. <laughs> Okay, so the first thing you need to know to understand the rest of this presentation is even though I don't sound like it, I am French, okay? <laughs> and what we're known for is a couple of things. We're known for wine and cheese, although I have to say that uh, the wine and cheese I had here is pretty damn good as well. We're known for fashion, and ladies, you can see that this is eminently wearable, French fashion. We're known for our strikes. And even though he's very small and you might not see him from that far away, we are known for... Oh, no, sorry, I missed one. So we're known for Zidane, of course. He's a bit more famous than Beckham. I'm sure he would have filled that stadium. And uh, we're known for our diminutive president who wants to be the emperor of the world. <laughs> but none of that is why I'm here today. I'm here because increasingly we are known for fiber. Now... Before I move on to the next slide, and I'm trying to remember what the next slide is, um, the important thing is that, in fact, I've been, the last couple of days, I've been fuming at some of the comments, not because they were wrong, but because I wanted to answer these comments. And I'm going to try to do that through this presentation. Um, I guess the point I want to make before I move to this next slide is we should stop saying that there's no business model to deploy FTTN, because there is and I'm going to talk about that, and also that we should stop looking only as much as I think it's really important to think about what the revenues are going to be on this new infrastructure, and you know that's one of the key areas of my research, but there's also other dynamics at hand. That's not the only thing that comes into the equation. So um, if we think about copper today, we're seeing a number of things. First of all, copper was never designed to do broadband, and increasingly it's stretched to its limits. That means it's increasingly unreliable. One of its characteristics is it's, it's strongly asymmetric. It's geographically constrained. You can't cover, not everybody who has copper can have broadband service, as we've seen these last two days. And increasingly it's expensive to maintain because, as the previous speaker pointed out, sometimes it was laid out 100 years ago. If you look at fiber in comparison, the capacity that we can have over fiber is virtually unlimited. It's incredibly stable. That means that you don't get huge variations in the bandwidth that you get over broadband. It's potentially symmetric, depending on how you implement it. It's potentially ubiquitous because the attenuation is extremely low. And it's much cheaper to maintain. So that should lead us to one conclusion, which I will sum up with this picture. And if you take that on board, the question is not, how do we pay for the network? The question is, we have to deploy the next generation network because the old generation network is dying anyway. Once you've taken that on board, then you can start thinking about how is it going to pay for itself. But you have to accept first that this is not a choice. It's not a commercial choice. It's, it's we're being forced into deploying these next generation networks. And sure. We might not need them next year. We might not need them in two years. But if we don't have them in 15 years, then we're going to be in big trouble. So having said that, 
let's look at the business model. And I'm not saying that this business model looks, you know, extremely sexy. If it did, we wouldn't be here. One of the things that we hear very often from incumbents is that any form of network sharing is economically detrimental to them. They usually put that in words slightly prettier than what I just did, but that's what it comes down to. Now, in the next two slides, what I want to do is, first of all, to illustrate why very clearly copper and bundling has been profitable to incumbents, and second, to see what this teaches us about the fiber business model. Okay, so I took France as an example because that's where I live, and also because if the assertion is unbundling was unprofitable, you just have to find one example to prove that that assertion is wrong. So I'm using that one. This is broadband growth in France, and I hope the figures are, are, are big enough. This is broadband growth in France over the last nine, ten years. Now, you might wonder, why is there a big inflection point in 2002? Here, June 14th, 2002. Any, anyone has a guess what that date was? Sorry? No, well, it, it might, you might be right, but, but the relevance to the French market, sorry, the relevance to the French market is that that was the day where the unbundling tariffs were finalized by the regulator and put in place. Now, you can see this clear inflection on the market. Now, if I do a little bit of uh, uh, Uchronia and wonder what would have happened if unbundling hadn't been put in place, and I look at the growth trend before that date, this is what I come up with. So effectively, we would have something like a little above 5 million broadband customers in France if unbundling hadn't been put in place, based on the growth rates that we had before unbundling. And we currently have a little short of 20 million. Now, <clears throat> considering the incumbent is 50% of that market share, and not even taking into account the fact that their wholesale division is so profitable that the competitive operators this year asked if this wasn't supposed to be cost-based, you can clearly see that they made a lot of money. And in fact, you could argue that the ARPUs were lower because of that competition. But actually, if you map the ARPU, you see that, sure, it's lower than it was in 2003, but it's catching up fast. It's growing again. So the first thing I want to present to you today is let's stop with this argument that network sharing is inherently uneconomical. It isn't very clearly. 